We will start the discussion about the mean free path of molecules with the following model problem. Imagine that you and your friend have come to a forest. He is wearing a bright jacket and he walks away from you into the depths of the forest. And the question is, exactly how far does he really need to move away for you to stop seeing him? Well, it's clear that in some cases he might hide right behind the nearest pine tree, which is often the closest hiding spot. In others, he might walk for quite a while, sometimes covering a significant distance. In this sense, we're talking about the average distance he will move away from you, depending on the situation. We will get a similar result if we replace our view with a laser beam. Sometimes the beam will illuminate the nearest trees, and sometimes it will shine far away through the gaps between the trees. But it is quite clearly evident that there is a mean average distance or mean separation at which the laser beam hits the trunk of a tree. To estimate the mean free path, let's perform a geometric trick in order to accurately and precisely calculate it. Let's replace each tree with a point, the center of the corresponding circle, and let's replace the line of sight with a strip, the width of which is equal to the diameter of the tree. If a tree essentially blocked a beam of zero width, its central point would, in fact, actually fall within this strip, basically. The mean free path of the beam is typically referred to as the length of the strip that usually contains one tree. Then it turns out that the area in the forest corresponding to one tree is equal to the area of this strip. The first area is equal to the square of the average distance between the trees. And the second area is specifically equal to the diameter of the tree, precisely multiplied by the desired mean free path lambda. Hence, lambda is d squared divided by d, which is essentially the same as this formula can be conveniently rewritten as the diameter of the tree d multiplied by the square of the ratio of the distance between trees d to the diameter of the tree d. And this is simply the fraction of the forest area occupied by the tree trunks. Let's take the diameter of a tree as half a meter and the distance between trees as 5 meters, which is 10 times greater. Then the mean free path of the beam will be approximately about 100 tree diameters, which is roughly around 50 meters, which is to say, you could say, making it highly plausible. What does our model problem of the propagation of a light beam between trees have to do with, essentially, the movement of gas molecules, actually? The fact is that the size of a molecule is much smaller than the distance between molecules, and therefore a molecule flies freely from collision to collision, changing its direction, and thus there is an average distance that it travels between two collisions. And this average distance is an extremely important parameter for many processes and gases, especially in the context of the process of diffusion. Let's look at this model in more detail to see how diffusion occurs in gases in a comprehensive manner. Here in a closed box, balls are moving continuously, one of which is uniquely colored green and leaves a noticeable trail of its movement as it travels, creating a dynamic environment. Each of the balls indeed changes the magnitude and direction of its velocity upon impact. And Let's see how soon the green ball launched from the left wall will carefully reach the right wall of the box in this experiment. Now he has already moved to the right half of the field, and if the other balls didn't interfere with their chaotic and unpredictable pushes, he would quickly reach the right wall with the next hit directed to the right. But due to successive and continuous random hits, he wanders back and forth aimlessly. Although now he is noticeably approaching the wall, and maybe the next hit will direct him towards the goal, he is clearly focused and determined. He has been trying for some time, and each attempt brings him slightly closer. Another, go! As a consequence, the trajectory traveled. By this ball indeed proved exactly to be significantly much longer than the distance between the walls. Now, let's see how exactly diffusion occurs in real gases. Let's conduct an experiment with the diffusion of carbon dioxide in air. We'll take a cup and turn on the scales, so their readings are currently at exactly zero. We poured acetic acid into this jar and we'll place a packet of baking soda in it. Carefully close the lid with the outlet tube and gently shake the jar so that the reaction starts and carbon dioxide is released. Direct the outlet tube into the cup. 
The density of carbon dioxide is one and a half times greater than the density of air. Carbon dioxide gradually displaces air from the cup, and we see that the readings on the scales gradually increase, although by a very, very small amount, only a few hundredths of a gram. Let's carefully and slowly remove the outlet tube and gradually see how the readings on the scales continuously and consistently change over time. We see that initially the excess mass increased, and when the cup was filled with carbon dioxide, the excess mass was 80 milligrams. And then the carbon dioxide molecules very gradually and extremely slowly left the cup, while the nitrogen and oxygen molecules, on the contrary, penetrated into it. So the excess mass became smaller and smaller over a period of time. The average thermal velocity of a CO2 molecule is approximately 250 meters per second. And if all the molecules were indeed flying in the same direction, they would leave the cup in one thousandth of a second. But we see that the distinctive diffusion time, which is found to be approximately around 10 minutes, is about, and this happens because the molecule chaotically and unpredictably changes its direction of movement constantly from collision to collision in a random manner. To estimate the mean free path of a molecule in air, we will proceed exactly as we did when estimating the mean free path of a laser beam in a forest among the trees. Let's draw a tube whose length is equal to the mean free path of a molecule, lambda, and whose cross-section is estimated as the square of the molecule's diameter. On average, there is one molecule in the volume of this tube. On the other hand, in fact, each molecule actually occupies a volume of d cubed, where d is, in reality, the average distance between air molecules. So d cubed essentially is equivalent to lambda times d squared. Where does the mean free path lambda basically come from? This is d cubed divided by d squared, which is very, very conveniently to rewrite as. The diameter of the molecule d multiplied by the cube of the ratio of d to d approximately. And this is just the fraction of the volume that the molecules themselves occupy in the air. In liquefied air, the molecules are packed closely together. At the same time, its volume decreases by approximately a thousand times compared to its gaseous state. Therefore, the mean free path is approximately 1,000 times the size of the molecule. The size of the molecule is approximately 10 circumflex 10 meters. So, the mean free path is about 10 circumflex 7 meters, or 0.1 microns. And now for our final question. The height of this cup is approximately 10 centimeters. And the mean free path of the molecule is 0.1 microns which is a million times smaller. And so the question arises, how many collisions will a molecule make on average before it escapes the cup? And what distance will it cover in the process, approximately, in total? Please share your thoughts on this in the comments section of this YouTube video, and let us know what you think.